coming. Hello, hello. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty awesome, isn't it? It is. It's pretty great. <laughs> First off, welcome. So this is all really based on uh, a talk that Lori Lynn gave about six months ago at a small gallery in Ewing, Kentucky. And I was so moved um, by her talk that uh, when the opportunity came up again here at uh, LexArts uh, during the Arts Weekend, I said, ooh, ooh, can I, uh, can I get on your... Um, coattails and tag along and because there was something about her discussion and about her journey um, in, in doing the artwork that really spoke to me and it was uh, really familiar to me. So um, this is Lori Lynn. Uh, I'm Copana in case you guys haven't figured it out and this is Lori Lynn's beautiful work up here. This is just a sampling of what she had uh, several months ago uh, when she gave her talk and so I, I'm just honored and proud to be here. And so I want you to tell them um, what you told uh, <laughs> the, the folks that were at Ewing uh, back in November. Well, thank you. Thank you, Copana. I'm very you honored. You'll get my bill later. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'm going to try to abbreviate, abbreviate what I've said before. But uh, these are my paintings. These are what I call prayer paintings. And um, they they truly are prayers. I begin my process by writing a prayer on the canvas, um, starting to build layer of color and shape until an image comes forward for me, and then that's how I know what I'm painting. Um, so it is part of my private and personal devotional practice, but um, I was just saying earlier that at some point during the creation of was as I'm working with this process I realized these paintings really aren't finished until they come out into the world um, that I have to allow them to be seen the um, vulnerability of that is an important part of what I'm doing so to talk about that process and where it comes from I have to tell you two little pieces of my biography and the first is my uh, walk with spirituality and my faith and religion. And I'm from Kentucky. I was christened in the Methodist Church. I had early days in the Methodist Church. And then uh, when I was about six years old, my mother, who's a church organist, played a service at an Episcopal church. And she had a moment where she realized that this is what I am. I am an Episcopalian. And so she found a permanent job at an Episcopal church and my family moved its membership. And so I was raised in the Episcopal Church, but in a sort of unusual way. It was a very tiny, tiny parish. We actually were an interdenominational congregation led by an Episcopal priest. There were very few children or young people when I was growing up in the church, and there was nothing that we would today call formation. There was no Sunday school. There were no discussions. There was Sunday morning. That was it. And so over the years, um, I began to have a lot of questions and conflict with where was I as a female in this structure. Um, the more I learned about things and became aware that I'm practicing a religion that comes down through the language of the patriarchy. What does that mean for the sacred feminine? Where is the feminine in Christianity? Um, and I really didn't have anyone to talk to about it. I didn't hear anyone talking about those things. And so I didn't have um, any sort of hostility or anger or, you know, I'm going to split from the church. It wasn't like that. It was just I, did, I felt like when I looked around, and I don't think this is accurate, but my perception when I looked around was people are just coming here and doing these things and saying these things that I, I can't find the meaning in it. I don't know what it is. So... I branched off and went looking for other ways to have spiritual experience, to think about God, to think about myself and God. Um, if you had met me in my 20s, I would have told you I was spiritual but not religious. Um, I, I got involved in lots of groups of women who were spiritually minded, who were 
talking about these issues and they were wonderful and I felt very nourished by that and it was exciting and interesting. I was also not very good at not being religious because I still prayed the rosary and I still <laughs> went to church on Christmas Eve and so I was kind of floating between these two worlds and really about three years ago um, I very suddenly came back to church and it happened for me that in my morning uh, meditation and prayer practice, I started to receive this message. It was very clear to me that I was gonna go back to church and I'm very stubborn and I don't listen to those messages. And so I kept saying, no, 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 I've been down that road, that's not gonna happen. Um, it was insistent, this guidance, that this was what was gonna happen. And so um, I did go back to church and um, found a church that I love, where I felt very at home and it was, intellectually stimulating and it was uh, the ritual of worship felt good to me but um, at that point I had been away for so long and I had been doing so many other things and involved in so many other things that I really was terrified I felt like there's gonna be a witch burning as soon as I walk into this place like I had this sense of people are being nice to me now but when I start talking <laughs> they're not gonna want me here that was really the feeling that I had so I went in and talked to the rector of my church and explained all of this to him. And he said, you know, welcome. I'm glad you're here. And I was, again, uh, wrong. I was very wrong about what was happening in that particular church, about what was happening in Christianity in general. Um, and so it was really a integration and a homecoming for me to come back to a path that I thought I had figured out and then to realize oh, I had not figured this out at all and it was actually an important aspect of who I am. Um, meanwhile, I have a very similar path with art making, which is that I was always drawn to creative pursuits. That was always where my interest was in my education. I ended up majoring in studio art. Um, simply because I loved it. I loved the feeling of being in the studio. I never thought I'm gonna be a great artist or even that I had any talent as an artist. I just loved it. That's where I felt really comfortable. And I thought artists are the people who are really doing something. They're really talking about life in a way that is exciting to me. Um, and, but then after I graduated, I moved to uh, New York City. And I lived there for almost 10 years. And I continued to make art for a little bit when I first moved. Everyone I knew in the city was an artist, and they were real artists. I mean, they were making it happen. And I became really disillusioned with the art world and the way that I was listening to people talk about art and talk about artists. And I took myself out. I decided I wasn't going to make images anymore. I felt intimidated by that, and I wasn't going to do it. And I pursued my writing interests, which I had also always had. I ended up getting a graduate degree in fiction writing. So that's two unusable degrees <laughs> that I have. And um, <laughs> um, moved back to Kentucky. That's the abbreviated version. Um, but what happened was around the same time that I started having this feeling about organized religion and about going back to church, I realized I needed to paint, um, and it was not good enough to me to make some other sort of image or to bake or you know, use my creativity in some other way. I really, really needed to be standing in front of a canvas and move paint, and in much the same way my return to church, it was terrifying. I stood in front of a blank canvas and felt every emotion that you can possibly feel and shame and anger and all of these things. Um, but I had this newfound attitude about what art making actually is. And I had a belief that creativity is the language of God and that when we're in our creative selves, we are in communion with the divine. And that is how I started to develop this style of painting. And I told myself in the beginning, I'm not making art. I don't care about color theory. I don't care about composition. Nobody's ever gonna see these things. It's just what I'm gonna do. And now, three, three years later, I think I'm realizing that I am making art, just the way that I make it. 
and um, really is so much about reclaiming. But both of those uh, journeys were really about reclaiming voice and about allowing myself to be who I am, to believe what I believe, to practice the way that I practice, and carving out a little place for my voice, whatever that is. Yay. <laughs> I mean, my story is so less eloquent oh. than that, but it's so similar right. um, in, in that um, I grew up in the Pentecostal church, and uh, I always kind of laugh when my Catholic friends talk about guilt, because I just think, you don't know anything about <laughs> guilt. Um, but, it, you know, I, I grew up in the church, and it was this church in particular, and it was because of my grandmother. And um, she, as you can tell, she was, a, she was very devout. Um, and she helped found this church um, that they started building it in the late 40s. They, uh, the men parishioners uh, did the building while the women did the cooking and did the bake sales and uh, whatever else that they could do to raise the funds um, to build the church. And she was the last uh, founding member. So uh, this was her funeral uh, on the inside of the church. She was seven weeks shy of 99 when she died. And... Uh, so she was, she was extraordinary, and um, she, she was passionate uh, about it uh, to the point that, you know, by the time I hit my late teens, I mean, I kind of got a little tired of the passion because it's, uh, um, I needed to branch out, I needed to look at other things. And there was a brief, and I grew up in eastern Kentucky, but there was a brief time uh, in my tweens when we actually lived in Tucson, Arizona. So when I was there, I was exposed to a lot of other people who were not like us, um, either culturally or uh, religiously. And so, you know, that gave me pause a little bit. And, and also, you know, my mother didn't say, this is the only church that you have to go to. She took me to a variety of churches, but they were all basically evangelical churches. Um, when I got out of high school, it wasn't too long before I got myself in a rock and roll band and we started uh, traveling the country. Uh, and then I really got exposed to a lot of different people. And, uh, you know, I wasn't going to church uh, by that point. And um, I became uh, a lot a lot more interested in, in other things that were out there. Um, because the more I thought about it, the more I thought, well, if the only way to God is through Jesus, then that's leaving off about three quarters of the planet. And I just can't see a God making those kinds of choices. And then, and then there was the art, right? So um, I, my grandmother loved photographs. She didn't take a lot, but she loved them. And one of the things um, that she really liked were, were photographs of dead people. <laughs> Usually uh, they were relatives. And, um, you know, I've since come to learn that it, that used to be the only way that they got to see the funeral at the time because they couldn't travel. You know, most of her brothers and sisters moved to Ohio and um, raised families there and you know you become disconnected and that's the only way that you can um, attend their funeral is by seeing these photographs so I always thought that was a little more morbid until she died and I walked into the church the morning of her funeral and I went wow that's just beautiful it's really beautiful and and I know that she is dead but I've never seen I know this is going to sound weird but I've never seen a more beautiful corpse she glowed she glowed and I think part of the reason she glowed is because she glowed when she was alive. You know, the, all of that passion, that religious fervor and, and uh, uh, devotion, the things that in some ways in her later years made it hard to talk to her uh, because no matter where we started the conversation, it always came back to Jesus or the Bible or the church. And so it made it hard to have uh, deep conversations about anything else. But all of those all of those things actually is what sustained her for many, many years. And it got her through, um, you know, 99 years of really hard stuff, hard life stuff. And um, it was the, the very thing that made her spirit glow. And so th that doesn't have anything to do about art. Okay, so <laughs> the deal with art is... That's everything to do. <laughs> 
<laughs> so, so she loved photographs, and it was my mother that really started uh, doing a lot of photos. Um, my dad was stationed in Germany. Uh, Mom went over to be with him. I was made in Germany, though I was born here. And uh, she bought an Agfa camera while she was in Germany. And I grew up playing with this uh, awesome little camera. She still has it. So I grew up playing with this camera, and she would take lots of pictures. And, and I just always loved it. And um, I got to high school. They put me on the yearbook staff. I did photographs through there, but I didn't really have anybody to you know, really train me about composition and technique and all of that stuff. It just really wasn't happening. And then I just sort of dropped it because I joined this rock band and started touring up, you know, around the country. And um, I, I just sort of put it to the side. Uh, and when the musical career, career came to an end, I decided to go back to college. And I had been doing a lot of art, drawing um, in particular. I, I, I'm not like Lori Lynn. I, I couldn't paint my way out of a paper bag if I had to. I'm just not very good with color. But I love to draw. And so I went back to college. I never changed my residency the whole time that I was traveling, so I still got in-state tuition in <laughs> Kentucky. So I came back and enrolled at UK, and um, I, I was doing you know, the whole art track, and um, I needed an elective one year, and I thought, well, I'll take a photo class and you know, see if anything's changed in the 10 years since I stopped doing it so much. A lot of things had changed, and mostly what had changed was um, our professor, Carrie Peterson who actually sat down and taught me all the things that I had not been taught when I was in high school. And so that rekindled um, my love for photography and I forgot about drawing basically and I just stuck with um, photography. And then like you, once I finished my degree, I thought, well, I'm, I'm just gonna be a, a self-sustaining artist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know, <laughs> right? And you start hanging out with all these other people who are artists that are really doing well. And, and I wasn't even in New York, you know, I was here. But the funny thing is that, you know, and it might be like this in New York, it's, it, it, in a way, it's sort of cliquish. Right. It's very cliquish. And, and I was not on the same track as everybody else. And so if, you know, if you're not on the same track as everybody else, it's easy to become intimidated. Mm -hmm. And after a while, you just get tired, you know? It, it is a lot of work to try and be self-employed. So at one time, I found myself with eight different part-time jobs, and my ninth job was trying to keep myself in work, and it wore me out. And so um, at one point, I started working at a horse farm. It was only one job, and then I developed really bad allergies to horses, really, wow. really bad allergies to horses. And as luck would have it, um, a position came open at the University of Kentucky that was looking for uh, somebody to do microfilm. And lo and behold, that strange uh, bachelor's degree I had in photography actually paid off. This is one of the few instances when it actually paid off. And so I took this job at UK, and I've been there now. Uh, it'll be 15 years next month. Um, and then what happened was a lot like what happened with you. I took all of the energy that I'd been spending on making art and I sunk it into a job. And I sunk it into a job that ultimately didn't love me back. And it took me over a decade to figure that out. So in 2011, that's when my grandmother died. My best friend Lance died. They died three months apart. My job was coming to an end. I was on uh, soft money, which just means I was grant funded. The job was going to end. I saw really no chance that they were going to keep me on at UK, even though I'd been there so long. Um, and things were just really bad. You know, I hit a really, really, well, one of the lowest points of my life, I think. I sat down one day and I thought, you know, I have not been making any art. And all this time, I took all of that energy and I put it into it, to this thing that wasn't going to love me back. And, I, you know, it cost me. It cost me the one thing that I really loved to do. And so I decided I'm going to do something about that. I'm going to, I'm going to take a photograph a day. I don't care if it's with my phone. I, it's just going to be one photograph a day. And <laughs> I made the mistake, or not, of saying so to my friend um, 
Mary Carol Hackett, who is a creative writing professor at Longwood University. And she calls me up and she said, you have to blog this. And I said, no, no, this is just for me. You know, I haven't picked up a camera in a really long time and I had just gone digital, you know, and Crystal talked me into going digital because I, you know, I had moved to a house that didn't have a dark room anymore. I couldn't really do film. If I did, I'd have to have somebody else print it. And, you know, there is a bit of a control freak in me that didn't want to do that. I didn't want to give away that kind of control. So she taught me into going digital. So I had this digital camera. It's like, well, you know, it's kind of like when I first got a computer. I looked at it for six months before I ever took it out of the box. <laughs> Set it in a room by itself and I would pass it every day and go, oh my God, I, oh, I'm just going to tear it up. That's really what I thought. I'm just going to tear it up. So I would look at this camera and I'd go, oh my God, I'm just going to tear it up. And the, the pictures don't look the way the traditional film pictures look and I just can't stand it, you know? And so it was terrifying. But at the same time, I was at this super low point and I went, oh, what the hell? Do something about it. So then I say to Mary, Mary, I, you know, I'm going to do this. And she goes, you have to blog it. And I went, no, no, this is just for me. She goes, no, I, I'm telling you. And Mary is very spiritually in tune. She's uh, mostly Native American out of North Carolina. She found me through Facebook. She saw some connection with me through an Appalachian group. And she came to my house. And she said, I had this dream about you. I need to talk to you. And she came to my house. And she talked to me about embracing art. And so you see how the stars start lining up. And um, so I said, OK. Well, I had a friend of mine who was hosting my website at the time. And he'd been years trying to talk me into doing, uh, moving my website to WordPress. Well, WordPress is great for blogging. I went, oh, well. How convenient. He's already loaded it on the server. I might as well do it. And for some reason, he had titled it The Outhouse. I don't know, still to this day, I don't know why he named it that. So over Christmas break, you know, I'm moving my website all over to WordPress, and I just couldn't think of a better name than The Outhouse. So I tacked on Where Art Goes, and I thought, okay, well, the really fun people will get the joke, <laughs> and everybody else, they'll eventually get the joke. So I started doing the outhouse, and I did a blog every day. And I did it with this blog was a photograph that I said that I was going to do every day. But I also really wanted to um, be a lot more positive in my life, because I was really surrounded by a lot of negative people. Uh, so I went out, and I found a positive quote, and I made this format. It starts with a positive quote, and then comes the photograph, and then I'm going to write a, a sentence or maybe a paragraph about the one good thing that happened that day. And I don't care if it takes me three hours to find the one good thing that happened that day, but there had to be something good that happened that day if all it is is that I'm alive. And so when I first started, sometimes it would take me three hours to find that one good thing. I'd write and write, delete, delete, delete. Write, 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 no, nah, delete, delete, delete. Write, write, oh no, don't say that. <laughs> delete, 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 you know? And it might take me three hours, but at the end of that time, I had found the one good thing out of the day. And so, for all I knew, the only person that was checking it out was Mary, because it was all her idea to start with, with, with this blog anyway. And I started on the first day of January in 2012. And by February, I had people stopping me on campus or calling me or sending me private messages saying, you don't know how I've come to look forward to your daily uh, blog post. And I would say, why? And I said, because it's just so positive. It's just so I look for, you know, they weren't coming for the photographs. They were coming for the quotes, <laughs> you know, or, or uh, the positive nature of whatever I had found that day. And so, you know, six months into this thing, I realized that I, I got a lot more than I bargained for out of this blog. I thought it was just for me, and here it was touching all these other people's lives. And in the process, I was starting to get in a rhythm of being positive myself 
and letting go of all the things that I couldn't control, which was just about everything at that point. Um, and I was learning this new craft because it really was like a new craft, this digital, this digital beast that I, you know, looked at in a box somewhere else. Um, finally, I was, I was getting in tune with it and I would talk to Crystal every day and I would talk to Tracy Hawkins uh, periodically and I would talk to all these other people who were photographers who ultimately had, had to deal with the same things that I was dealing with. You know, we had all been trained in traditional photography um, and some of us came to digital a lot later than others. And so that's how the blog came into being. It's in its fifth year now. I haven't missed a day. And it's become an addiction. Some people become addicted to drugs, some to alcohol, some to sex, or some to running, or some to, you know, whatever you become addicted to. I've become addicted to this blog. And so I do a post every day. And I choose the quotes, sometimes about two weeks out. And it is freaky how often what I find positive in that day and the photograph that I choose to post that day. Because, you know, I chose something two weeks ago. I don't remember what it was. And it's freaky how often they, they mesh. And uh, I love that about it. That's got nothing to do with this work. <laughs> But it does, in a way. I mean, uh, uh, you know, where her, her, her stuff is based on prayer, the actual prayer, I take prayer in making the photographs. I have, to, I have to turn off the TV, I have to not answer the phone, and I have to center myself when I sit down in front of that computer to process the photograph for that day and to make the post for that day and to find the one good thing. And I think that is prayer. I mean, it I is think prayer. It is a method of prayer. It absolutely is a method of prayer, and uh, and that's why you know when I first heard you talk um, about your process, I went, oh, it it is the same process mm -hmm. in in a different way, and uh, it was the same sort of moving away from the church, and then coming back to it. You know, the one thing where the church comes into play for me here, I think that I that I didn't express was that well over a decade now, Stacy Yelton got me to go to First Presbyterian Church, which is just across the street here. And it is very, very different than going to a Pentecostal church, let me just say. It is very, very different. And I was really intimidated at first when I walked in because, you know, they, it, it, it is uh, based on ritual. And, you know, they follow the uh, Christian calendar a lot more closely, I think, than uh, the Pentecostal church. And, you know, Pentecostal church is like a jam. If I think about it in terms of music, it is just like a big old jam. You know, it's open mic night. <laughs> <laughs> it's open mic night, you know? It really is. If you, if you look on Facebook under religion, you know, where it asks you, you know, what, what is your religion? I call myself a presbyterian, <laughs> And I do that because um, along the way, Buddhism, I, I read a lot uh, on Buddhism, and it really spoke to me. You know, it's not... It was never meant to be a religion in the first place. It was, it was a philosophy, and I really um, bonded with that. I, uh, you, know, the, you know, just try to be peaceful. Try and let go of everything that drags you down. You know, suffering is one of the four noble truths, and I can't even tell you what the other three are because the, the first one spoke to me so much about <laughs> suffering. You know, it's like you're going to suffer. That's part of being a human being, but how much you suffer depends on you. And that's where the outhouse really helped me. I was in the process of letting go of all of that suffering and, and calming myself down and being at prayer with the photograph and with what happened in my day and taking a real close look at it, mm. you know? Um, so that's where the Buddhism comes in. But, you know, within four or five months of attending the Presbyterian Church, I loved it. I loved it. I loved the structure and I loved the rituals. I loved the intellectual curiosity that it forced me to have. Mm -hmm. When I started doing the Sacred Spaces series, it was the first series that I had done in over a decade. And I started doing it because First Presbyterian Church offered me um, an exhibit. And I had been talking uh, a decade ago 
probably, with a friend of mine who's an atheist. And we had been talking about, she's also a photographer, and we had been talking about going out and photographing churches. She, here's this atheist, and she was enthralled with churches. And so we had talked a little bit about it and you know, never got around to it, and then she moved, and that was sort of the end of it. And when they offered me the opportunity uh, to do this exhibit, I thought, hmm. Well, you know, I have been thinking about this thing for about 10 years, so maybe I ought to do something about it. And, and that's how it started. And so, you know, sometimes they, they, uh, I post them in the outhouse, um, and sometimes I don't. Um, I've got about, well, I have thousands of photographs. I'll just say in the first year that I did the outhouse, I amassed about 14,000 images. And it's about the same every year. And I take my camera with me wherever I go, never trying to miss an opportunity. And it's funny now, uh, people who are in the outhouse, they all know one another from the outhouse <laughs> and they've never met. So Lori Lynn, I can tell you right now, she's sitting here going, I know her, and I know her, and I know her, and I know her, and it's because you've all been in the outhouse in some that's way. Right. And everybody in the audience is going, oh, that's Lori Lynn. Oh, yeah, so, um, yeah. <laughs> so, I, you know, girl, you just got to rein me back in, otherwise I'll just, you know. It's the whole open <laughs> mic thing, right? Pentecostal roots. Or it, oh. Yeah, <laughs> just, just start talking. Yeah. Great. Yeah. I, I, how, how do you feel since you started doing this project, has that had a, a personal impact for you in the way that you see yourself or your faith or the world? Well... Hmm. I think, you know, this is the first year, yes, so yes. How is it, did it impact me personally? Yes. And it impacted me in a way that, for instance, this is the first year that I've actually observed Lent. I actually gave up something for Lent. Now my grandmother, she used to do it sort of quietly on her own and never said much about it other than I would notice she would skip dessert for a really long period of time, <laughs> you know? And that's what it was. Sometimes she would fast for a few days at a time. Um, so as I started doing these photographs on sacred spaces, which I've been doing for about 18 months now, uh, I would walk into them and nine times out of 10, God just, I would walk in and I just felt like I was being hugged I just get a great big old hug, and there didn't have to be anybody else in the room but me. But there's something about a space when, you know, I think the Bible says something about, you know, where two or more shall gather, you know, there, and you, you create your church. And, you know, this place could be a church if we wanted it to be. We are all gathered here in communion together in some way to talk about, um, you know, our spiritual moments. and. And I feel that when, when I go into these places. And I think the more that I did that, the more I had to examine my own self, and the more I had to examine um, really what I needed to let go of in order to uh, be a better person. Uh, you know, but what, what bothers me about this work is that it is so heavily Christian. And um, it, it, I've got a few pieces in there, uh, not here, but I've got a few pieces that um, speak to Native American um, spirituality um, and Buddhism. Spiritualists, I've visited a spiritualist camp, but even that's based in Christianity yeah. um, most of the time. And uh, so I realize how as varied and wonderful as my friends are, uh, they seem to be either atheists or Christians. <laughs> <laughs> You know, there's, and so um, I would like to take the series and expand it a bit more and look at other religions that are out there. It's interesting because I think I have the exact opposite movement that's happening. When I first started doing these, they looked a lot more pagan. They, they were influenced a lot by different sorts of traditions. Um, and as I go forward in time, they look more and more Christian and they have the, cr the symbol of the cross on the third eye usually or holding a rosary or I feel like I'm 
go, it's like the same exact thing that you're talking about, except yeah. uh, going in a different direction. Yeah, but you know, even though I want to examine other religions, I think in the process of doing that, I still have to look in me. It still right. re it still requires that I. We just have this lens. This is the only lens we yeah, have. Yeah, that's it. Exactly. Yeah. That's it. Exactly. So, um, talk a little bit more about uh, the prayers um, that mm -hmm. that you um, for for those of you who came in late. So she, <laughs> there. These are these are real prayers. She starts with a prayer or a meditation for the day, and um, <laughs> talk a little bit more about how you come up with that prayer and or the meditation. Well. Um, the two on the top are very quick paintings this, that, that would have been one day or two days to complete those. And those prayers are just whatever is in my mind at that moment. When I, you know, I light a candle, I get quiet, I'm standing in front of the canvas, and then whatever is in my heart that needs to be expressed. Sometimes the prayer will, be, uh, will relate to the liturgy or whatever. Um, the prayer is in the church for that day, mm -hmm. but usually it's not. It's usually just whatever I'm thinking about um, or struggling with, whatever I need to say will be the prayer. This one, um, I actually did this painting as part of a course with a teacher named Shiloh Sophia McLeod who teaches what she calls intentional creativity. Um, so this painting went over the course of 2015, and on every full moon she would send a course of inquiry and do journal writing and talk about the issues and then take that onto the canvas and paint. And so sort of two different um, origin of the prayer. This painting certainly is also a prayer, but it's multiple prayers. It's layers and layers of what happened all over the course of the year. Um, so for that, the one that's on the top there with the rosary really is very personal painting for me that is about the suppression of voice and my so allowing my voice to come forward. Um, this one is um, kind of a mystery. It was, I, I remember what the prayer is that's on the canvas, but I think I still am not entirely sure what that image, why that particular image came forward, um, which is what keeps me interested in the process is that I don't know what's going to happen. Um, something that's interesting to me about this one, th th these courses that she teaches, they are all about the Blessed Mother. It's all about Mary and um, our relationship with Mary, the Mother of God. During 2015, I lost a very close friend. And after her death, I had a very difficult time working on this painting. I couldn't come to it and I would read the inquiry and I would sort of halfway do the journal writing and then I wouldn't paint. Um, and I realized that even though my friend and I were the same age, she had been a mother to me. She, the, the relationship that we had was that she was very nurturing to me. And you know, if you ever have one of those people who just always champions you, no matter what you do and how badly you mess up, that person's always there. That's who she was for me. And I realized that thinking about the mother thinking about the, the cosmic mother, um, it, it was very painful and difficult for me to go into the painting because of the loss of that friend. But when I made that realization, I could paint again. And I went back into this painting. I never talked about that at, uh, outside of the class. Um, and then when this painting was complete, a mutual friend of ours said to me, those look like Heather's eyes. Hmm. Um, and so that's the kind of, that is the way the prayers manifest for me, I guess, during the process is that things happen that I don't know, and that's how the prayers answer, just through whatever happens on the canvas. Yeah. So how, how do you see, how do you see yourself moving forward with this? Do you do this, you do this every day? I do do this every day. Um, is it a new painting every day? No. Um, that is one way that it's moving forward, is I'm spending more time I think with the paintings, mm. they're becoming more like paintings <laughs> and less like um, exercises, I yeah. guess. Yeah. Um, but I do tend to paint fast um, because I, I, I usually ha will have two paintings going at the same time so that I can switch from one to the other. Um, and I think um, they're becoming more conceptual, I would say, that I'm yeah. starting to think a little bit more uh -huh. about the object and what 
what is the object going to be when it's complete. So most of your paintings, though, are Mary. They are, or some aspect of the sacred feminine. Mm. Mm -hmm. I have painted, uh, there is a pa I did a painting of Mary Magdalene and the Christ, and um, that's one of the only times I've ever tried to paint a male figure. One of my nieces came into my studio and said, is that Jesus? And I said, yes. And she goes, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think she, <laughs> I don't think I'm there yet. <laughs> <laughs> the portrayal of Christ. <laughs> and that's actually, you know, that especially you mentioned Tracy, my partner Tracy, he's not religious, has never been religious, and he's very supportive of me painting, but that's a question he, are you ever going to paint anything else? Is it always going to be Mary? <laughs> like, is there anything else? Uh, but no, not, I have no plans to paint anything else. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm sure I will at some point, but. But you don't have I'm to. Not done. <laughs> that's the great thing about being an artist, you know, yeah. you can do whatever yeah. you want. One of the things that I was hoping to um, come away with today, for instance, is um, a better sense of where uh, the series is going to go from here, because uh, uh, the Sacred Spaces series for me so far has been um, mostly without people. So, you know, that helps my uh, agoraphobic self not have to engage with people. I can just walk into a building and sort of photograph the building and walk out. But, you know, I just make very compelling photographs <laughs> sometimes, you know, because I'm not an architectural photographer, not really. I mean, if when you look at the photographs of my grandmother, for instance, as compared to Cane Ridge and um, the Basilica that's uh, up in Covington, um, she's a lot more compelling. Um, Lori Lynn actually said something to me um, several months ago when we were having this conversation. Uh, how about following people? How about picking maybe two or three people and, um, and following them on their spiritual path? You know, so I, I hope you know you volunteered yourself. I'm gonna be followed. <laughs> <laughs> so, but you know, there was, um, uh, in the exhibit that I had over at First Presbyterian Gallery, um, there was a piece from uh, Lori, no, there were two pieces from Lori Lynn's uh, house because she has uh, she has altars in different places uh, around her house. Well, one of the things that's interesting to me about the, the intersection of the creative process and, and the divine is the, is the way that opening up to that or, or maybe I should say recognizing that the presence of the divine and the movement of the divine is very much a part of what happens and what gets expressed and how much courage that can give us. It can be so daunting to figure out what you're going to do, face that blank canvas, get started in 2020, and to have that acknowledgement that there is a divine energy that wants to come through us and be expressed yeah. is somehow really reassuring. It is, and it's, I think when you can let go into it, then it is no longer, it's easy. It's all you have to do is just step into it, but that's all you have to do. <laughs> yeah. He's okay. Yeah. 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 Did you, um, when you go to a church, I'm sure you have to a lot of times get somebody to let you in and things. Is that the case? No, actually a, a lot of the places that I go to are already open. A lot of times, the churches won't let you photograph the services. Uh, some will, uh, but some won't. And I've talked to um, a pastor friend of mine uh, about why that might be. And, um, you know, th their take on it is that, you know, people come to church to find God, to commune with God, um, and to be at peace with that. And they don't want to really want to be on display uh, or feel like, you know, they're being focused on at the same time. That's really what I'm interested in. Um, but for most of the churches that I've photographed so far, so like the Basilica, for instance, is open every day until four o'clock and they encourage photographs. Oh, do come in, <laughs> you know, please take photographs. Uh, Cane Ridge is also open every day and it's actually enshrined. So, you know, I think a lot of people don't realize that um, a lot of the um, American denominations got their start just up the road at Cane Ridge, up in um, 
Bourbon County. Yeah. So they've actually built a shrine around this place. It is the original uh, building. Now, the balcony at one point had been taken out and put in a barn, and it was somebody's hayloft. When they got the money together to uh, build the shrine around this original uh, meeting house, they actually got uh, the balcony back. And board by board, they brought it back in mm. and put it back together. And, uh, you know, one of the great things about this meeting house is that it was uh, open to everyone. You know, if you're not familiar with the Great Awakening that happened in the early 1800s, that happened at Cane Ridge. And there were uh, estimates of up to 20 to, or 30,000 people that would show up. And they would come and stay as long as the food lasted. And they, you know, they couldn't all fit in this tiny meeting house, which is, you know, a simple log cabin that is nowhere near as large as this space that we're in here. There would be five, six, 10, 12 preachers preaching. And they'd be, you know, stump preachers. They'd be preaching on stumps outside and people pitch a tent and, you know, they'd hang out for weeks and months. And this happened two or three times. Um, and so it was, I thought it was really marvelous that they managed to save this church house. And they still have services there. You know, people will show up and, I mean, you have to reserve stuff ahead of time. But, um, you know, there might be a good chance that I could do uh, some photographs there during one of those services. Um, I've done some photographs at Lori Lynn's church at Good Shepherd. Um, I usually pop off a few shots before the service starts, you know, because I don't, I don't want to disturb anybody. I mean, because I think, I think what my minister friend said to me was important. You know, people are there to um, commune with God. It's an interesting thing because it is so intimate. I mean, it is a, very intimate. You're doing, it's the gathering of people, you're all together, but it's also personal and private at yeah. the same time. Yeah. Do you ever photograph Oh, oh yeah, and that goes back to, um, I have several friends that are Native American and I've talked to them at length about, my friends are very spiritual folks. Um, some of them are Christian, and even those that are Christian don't necessarily give up their uh, Native beliefs. And what is sacred to them probably above all else, um, from what I can gather, is water. It is the life-giving force. We uh, Human beings cannot survive without water, and we are 70% water. And so, yeah, I do, I do photograph a lot of uh, water spaces. Um, I, I was allowed to photograph one of my friends doing a sacred prayer at the water's edge. Um, but they weren't very good photographs. <laughs> so I, they didn't end up in the exhibit. And um, you know, I'll probably do more, but you know, one of the things that she stipulated is that I not uh, photograph her face. Uh, because again, that's not part of it. This is a very intimate thing that she was doing. Um, and it wasn't about her. It was about the prayer. And um, it was about God and the great creator the great spirit and being near the water. So, you know, part of, part of this is me learning how to photograph such an intimate thing without being invasive about it, you know, and being respectful. But I mean, I would feel horrible if something that I did in such a sacred space during somebody's sacred time would uh, be invasive and be seen as uh, overstepping my bounds. Oh my God, I just, I wouldn't get over it, I don't think. I think that's interesting too, because I think, I, even though what I'm doing is so very different from that, there's a similar thing that, I, there's um, a feeling about talking about these issues, about talking about faith and sacred practice and church, like everything I say or represent or do, it's almost like I want to put a disclaimer on it that says, I'm not speaking for my parish, I'm not speaking for my church, right. I'm not, I don't want ever to, it's, it is such personal material and people's feelings about it are so strong that you don't want to harm anyone. Yeah. That's the impulse. It's like I, 
I want to do my thing and talk about my thing, but I don't want to harm anyone else right. in the process, and I realize the potential is there yeah. for that. Yeah. You know, and even in, in some of the photographs that I do, and when I do my blog posts, if I, if I talk about uh, one of the posts uh, of, of the photographs that I do, I am always aware of my grandmother, and I'm always aware that my mother is reading the blog. <laughs> um, I always forget that. <laughs> that my mother <laughs> You didn't grow up in the Pentecostal church, <laughs> did you? <laughs> I've made my point. Um it well it, it is it is limiting. I try and keep it all in perspective. Uh you know, I, I have to be careful about what I say, but I guarantee that that little voice in the back of my head um, is doing me a favor ultimately. Hmm. It's a you know part of it is about uh, respecting my ancestors, and some of my ancestors aren't dead yet, you know, and can talk back to me, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and and might, and so you know I don't want to do that, but at the same time I don't I don't want to disrespect them. I want to have my own voice and my own thoughts, but you know I want to do so in a re in a respectful way to them. It's really interesting. My dad's side of the family is really, really big. And there are as many flavors of Terry as there are stars in the sky on that side of the family. And uh, it's been uh, really interesting to watch. Um, I think over the last five years, we've had a, a number of deaths in the family um, since um, this started, since the outhouse started. and. Um, I've really had to uh, really pay attention to all of us. And the thing that I come away with is that I love every one of them so much, even if we don't agree. And there's a bunch of us, that, I mean, we do not see eye to eye. Sometimes I think, how did I end up in this family? I'm so different, you know, I'm not a Republican. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, we are just so different, but at the same time, we are, we are cut from the same cloth. There's no doubt about it. So I want to be respectful to them, you know. So yeah, I, it is it is a little hard. The voice it does get in the way sometimes, but ultimately I choose to see it as a positive thing. So I'm really interested in um, one of the things that you said that came out earlier when we were talking about your grandmother about how the passion overwhelmed you. Some, at least in a part, you know, particular time of your life. So I was thinking a lot about that idea of passion, and passion, of course, comes up or in sort of getting, you know, moving toward, if you're a Christian, kind of a season of thinking about the passion of Christ and things like that. So thinking about passion and energy and creativity kind of all together. And so um, I don't know if that was something that, just, you know, wondering if you all had thoughts about, you know, sort of how do you moderate or sort of balance or focus or, you know, uh, expand or contract or open up to or, you know, sort of close off from because it's too much, you know, mm. passion, creativity, energy kind of all together. So, I, you know, I've heard, it seems like a lot of what you've been talking about is sort of around, you know, where do you put your focus, where do you put your energy, um, where do you find the divine in that? Sometimes you have to close yourself off because it's too much. Sometimes you're sad because it's not enough. Right. You know, mm -hmm. um, so that's, and also thinking about the forward steps thinking about how to capture that passion right you know mm -hmm. in a visual way and everybody has their own different ways of doing it so that's I love it, man. She's just given us a whole summary for the whole day. It's fantastic. <laughs> Thank you, Ruth. That's our, that's our girl. Yeah. 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 Uh, we were just talking about uh, this yesterday about how, um, you know, I, I said to her, when, when we brought the work down on Thursday to hang up, we went and had lunch, and, and on the way back to the car, I said, you know, I don't want to go back to work. I want, I want to go make more work. I want to hop in the car with the camera and go find something else to photograph. And, and uh, she had the same reaction. Yeah. And I think when I was listening to you talk, I was thinking about when I went back to painting, um, I didn't want to do anything else. I mean, I could have painted 24 hours a day um, I, I still I struggle with that of getting other things done that have to be done because when I'm painting, that's I feel like I am myself and I'm connected to God and I'm just in that flow. It is passionate and I have to force myself to not paint. Mm -hmm. 
And it's almost like an illness. Like, <laughs> like it is. <laughs> some sort of mental illness that you get swept away in. It is a bit like an illness. It is, It, yeah. it really is, because there, there are days when I don't want to go to work, not because I don't like what I'm doing, but because there is something else that is calling me that I need to go do. Right. You know? Um, and it's hard to, it, it's hard to compartmentalize, I guess, yeah. is the word. But you do have, you do, you have to. I mean, life goes on. You can't just squirrel yourself away in your house and, you know, with your work and, <laughs> well, I mean, Lori Lynn can, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So, you didn't really ask a question, but I didn't. I thought <laughs> I could sense you that people had energy around talking about them. Yeah. Uh, I just, you know, I think as sort of adults generally in life, that's one of the super challenges. Is you know, where do you, how do you balance having to do the things that you need to do and compete against <laughs> folk music? music. <laughs> and you know you. I just came from jazz band in Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you know, you really can't, I think. I mean, I think we have this idea that life is going to be balanced and that you can, yeah. um, you know, there's that phrase, like, if you really cared about it, you'd make time for it, which, of course, how do you make time? You can't make it. <laughs> <laughs> so I think... I think sometimes it is, it's a choice of, all right, I'm going to let those other things float down the river and I'm not going to do the dishes and you're going to come visit me in my house and you're going to leave with dog fur all over you because I didn't sweep it up for the past two weeks because I was painting instead. And sometimes you give up, you know, important things you do. <laughs> that other yeah. people don't want you to give up. Yeah. 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 So the mariachi music has started. Yeah, we might, that might be our cue. It might be our cue. <laughs> you know. and we've, have we answered all your questions, all your burning questions. I know that you just walked in here with all these burning <laughs> questions. If not, you have created questions, I think. Yeah? Ourself, or myself. Oh, good. Yeah. Good. And what do you do with your time? How do you connect with who you are to have something come out other than clean floor and things like that? Yeah, yeah. So important to me. Good. Yeah. Our job here is done. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anything? Anybody else? Anything? So, okay, well. Thank you. Thank you very thank much. You thank you. No, no, thank you, Lori Lynn. <laughs> okay, so let's all go drink green beer now. <laughs> it's St. <Saint> Patrick's Day. <laughs>